Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us. My name is Robert Baines. I am the president of the NATO Association of Canada. It's our job to make sure Canadians are uh, interested and informed about the value of security and the importance of NATO. Um, our organization puts on regular Zoom conversations. We're trying to make sure that lots of people are involved in the important uh, discussions of the time. And there's perhaps uh, nothing more pertinent and more important uh, at the moment than the relationship between uh, China and, and the West. The NATO Association of Canada is very uh, obviously concerned about the tensions which continue to rise uh, with China and the rest of the rules-based international order. Um, personally, I'm really keen to try to see how we can manage uh, that relationship. The trap of Thucydides is something that most people will have heard of. Thucydides is an ancient Greek historian, not very often mentioned outside of this context. But he wrote about uh, something called the Peloponnesian War, which is a, a conflict between two great powers. And uh, it was his gambit that uh, there could be a way to avoid war between great powers that were rising. Uh, and of course, that is one of the most important aims of any multilateral organization, to avoid conflict and to avoid war, which is one of NATO's greatest goals. Uh, so in our discussion today, we'll be kind of framing it with that, the hope that we can avoid conflict uh, and to uh, look at this soberly. We don't want to be, you know, uh, unrealistic in our goals and in our aims, but I think uh, avoiding conflict is something that everybody can get behind. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our editor-in-chief, Dr. Joseph McQuaid. Dr. McQuaid is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto uh, and has been with the NATO Association, uh, really helping our uh, academic development for the past three years. And I thank you so much for that, Joseph, and, and thank you for moderating this panel. Take it away. Thanks very much, Robert. And uh, thanks very much to everyone who is uh, watching live on YouTube right now. And also thank you in the future to everyone who is seeing this um, at a later date. Um, so I would really like to uh, start off by thanking um, our guests, uh, Dr. Joe Burton, Dr. Christina Lay, and Dr. Philip Shetler jones um, I'll be uh, saying a little bit more about each of their bios as I introduce them uh, for the panel, um, but I do just really want to uh, thank all of them for joining us today and for bringing um, a variety of really important and interesting perspectives to this conversation. So this conversation grew out of the conversation stimulated by our fall publication, uh, NATO and the Asia Pacific. Uh, so I would like to take a moment as well to give a special thank you to Bonnie Lau, the managing editor of that publication for her really fantastic work, uh, bringing together such a varied and exciting group of scholars. Um, and I also want to thank uh, NATO Association intern and program editor Emilio Angeles uh, for his uh, hard work organizing what promises to be an excellent event and uh, as well as for inviting me to moderate, which it is my honor to do. Um, so before I uh, dive into the event itself, I do want to begin by acknowledging this land on which the Toronto office of the NATO Association of Canada operates. For thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. In the post-pandemic world, one of the biggest questions facing NATO is how to navigate growing competition between China and the US, as well as managing an increasingly assertive Chinese presence on Europe's eastern flank especially in the form of regional infrastructural and financial projects undertaken under the auspices of the Belt and Road Initiative. The future of NATO-China relations is dependent on NATO's ability to develop a niche for itself to enhance cooperation with China as a partner, as well as competitor, while effectively addressing the security risks that may occur alongside uh, China's rise. In this discussion, our expert panel will examine how US-China competition brings NATO into the Asia, uh, into the Indo-Pacific, the challenges that China's rise poses uh, to transatlantic security, as well as uncovering opportunities for NATO to engage in the Asia-Pacific with like-minded partners. 
This panel, as it turned out, couldn't have uh, happened on a more fitting day, as today marks the historic first ever leadership level meeting of the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, or Quad, a regional grouping comprised of the US, India, Japan, and Australia. First initiated in 2004, uh, the Quad is an informal grouping, but one that is attracting increasing attention in policy and scholarly circles as one of several potential geopolitical counterweights to China, uh, Chinese naval operations in the South China Sea and elsewhere. While Chinese tabloids have dubbed the Quad uh, the NATO of Asia, the current scope of the grouping at present is far less ambitious than this. Still, today's leadership level summit uh, is an important step in the evolution of this relationship and may have important implications for NATO's relationships in the region, as well as the broader security landscape of Asia's oceanic frontiers. Um, so I did just want to kind of highlight that at the beginning, and it might be something that we return to within the discussion itself. So it is with great pleasure that I now introduce our speakers, as well as the structure for today's event. Each of our speakers will be providing comments uh, detailing their own various perspectives on the future of NATO-China relations. Uh, these initial comments will last about 10 minutes each. After this, I will pose some prepared questions in a structured Q&A period before opening up the discussion to questions uh, from the audience, at which point um, I will hand the, uh, the moderating over to Emilio Angelis. Please use the chat function to post your questions uh, during this period, and uh, we'll do our best to cover as many of them as we can. So without further ado, our first speaker today is Dr. Joe Burton, a senior lecturer in international security at the New Zealand Institute for Security and Crime Science, University of Waikato, uh, New Zealand, and a Marie Curie Fellow um, at Université Libre de Bruxelles where he is working on the two-year uh, European Commission funded project, Strategic Cultures of Cyber Warfare. He's the author of the book, NATO's Durability in a Post-Cold War World, um, as well as the editor of Emerging Technologies and International Security, Machines, the State and War. And his work has been published in uh, journals such as Asian Security, Defense Studies, uh, Political Science, and with a variety of other leading academic publishers. He's the recipient of the US Department of State uh, SUSI Fellowship, the Taiwan Fellowship, and has been visiting researcher at the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. Uh, Dr. Burton, it's a pleasure to have you today, um, and I will hand the mic over to you. Thanks very much, Joseph. That's a very kind introduction, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here, and it was a pleasure to contribute to the to the NATO Association of Canada publication on, on NATO and Asia, which I thought was a great publication. It was really an honour to be part of that. And thanks for following up um, with the session today. I'm delighted to be here among, among esteemed uh, company. Um, I, I just want to um, try and kick off our, our discussion and, and um, you, probably your, your viewers might be pleased or interested to know that I'm actually in Brussels in the, uh, the home of NATO at the moment, not in New Zealand. If I was in New Zealand, I think it'd be five o'clock in the morning. So thankfully my presence in Belgium is allowing me to do some interesting research on NATO, but also um, participate in, in panels that perhaps I, I wouldn't ordinarily um, uh, be able to. So it's, it's great, great to be here and great to join you. And, and I think the first thing I want to say is this is like an interesting uh, an important time for NATO. We've got a new US administration coming in. We've just come off the back of four years of probably one of the most contentious periods in transatlantic relations I've seen with uh, the Trump presidency and, and the tensions between that uh, administration and Europe. We're also entering a period where NATO itself is, is undergoing a, a process of, of reflection, a NATO 2030 process where it's looking ahead, looking to, to the future of the security environment in which it operates. Uh, and I think China and Asia will loom quite large in that process. And NATO are, of course, consulting on how they deal with China, what should their future strategy be for dealing with uh, China, uh, and this process will probably lead to a new strategic concept, which is kind of one of the main guiding documents of, of the alliance. And we haven't had one of those strategic concepts since 2010. And of course, a lot of ha has happened since then, not least uh, the end of the ISAF mission in Afghanistan, the annexation of Crimea, the COVID uh, pandemic, and again, this period of, of rather tense relations. So it's really a pivotal time to be looking at this question. And I commend the the NATO Association of Canada for, uh, for doing so. Um, and I think that this process of reflection probably needs to be uh, considering the Asia-Pacific Asia um, uh, more fully and the role of China in the world more fully. 
Um, I, I did a big project for the NATO Science for Peace and Security program uh, around 2016, um, following um, the annexation of, of, of Crimea. And there was a sense then, I think, that NATO was retrenching to Europe to some extent after that Afghanistan operation. They'd been in Afghanistan by that point 13 years. They wanted to bring troops ho home. They wanted to end the combat mission. Uh, and that mission was the catalyst for a series of relationships with um, NATO's partners in the Asia Pacific, not least Australia, New Zealand, who had troops in Afghanistan, uh, Japan, who contributed financially, South Korea as well. And some of those um, nations actually made a greater per capita contribution to the campaign in Afghanistan than some NATO uh, members. And I get the sense during that period, again, NATO was really focused on retrenching to Europe. And I actually think uh, and thought uh, at, at the time that that was somewhat of a mistake and that NATO should be, despite the Afghanistan mission ending, really trying to keep those partnerships with the Asia Pacific uh, countries going. And I think we've had a period over the last five, six years where some of those partnerships have atrophied and that's not been particularly helpful. And I think that, that, that there's an opportunity now to again, think again about how we want to invest in those partnerships with Asia Pacific countries and how that can benefit uh, NATO. Um, more specifically, I think, uh, you know, why do this? Why is this important? I think in recent years, we've seen, I think, China casting a growing shadow in Europe. We've, of course, had um, the, the pandemic, which has uh, supposedly emanated from China. I'm not one to, to call it a China virus. I think that that's the wrong language to use. Uh, I don't hold China directly responsible for the virus, but they certainly haven't helped in managing this global pandemic. And there was a level of secrecy and obfuscation, I think, in the early stages of the pandemic that uh, wasn't particularly helpful. And I think what this demonstrates is really the interconnectedness between these two regions. Um, we, we're going to face more pandemics as we move into the uh, 21st century. It's going to be a more common feature of, of our planet because of global warming. And we're going to see uh, a greater need for cooperation between world regions and a greater degree of connectivity between the Euro-Atlantic region and the Asia or Indo-Pacific uh, region. Um, in the technological sphere, we've also seen China, I think, growing, uh, casting a growing shadow in Europe. We've had the controversies about 5G, for example, that have caused, caused tensions within the transatlantic alliance, the rollout of, of new uh, uh, telecommunications uh, networks where there are serious causes uh, of concern around China's um, uh, Chinese uh, suppliers. Um, we've had um, uh, uh, whole scale um, campaigns uh, by China uh, related to the pandemic of cyber espionage, but more generally cyber espionage um, uh, uh, targeted at NATO uh, member states. And this is an ongoing process and an ongoing problem. And I think we're also seeing a pattern of increasing Chinese economic coercion uh, in Europe using their economic weight to buy influence and try and um, exploit and, and sow divisions within both the EU and NATO membership. So I think for that reason, China's increased presence in Europe, not least digitally uh, because of the problems around the pandemic, but also in the Arctic region as well and increased presence there. NATO has a legitimate reason to be concerned and to be driving new levels of cooperation uh, in this area. Um, the, Second point I'd make really is that I think we've also seen uh, an increased level of cooperation uh, within this globalizing security environment between China uh, and Russia, which is, of course, is uh, NATO's main historical uh, adversary. I think we have seen a closer relationship between these uh, two countries emerge uh, in recent years. And I think, again, both China and Russia, whether it's in a collected or concerted fashion or otherwise, have been trying to exploit divisions in Europe, trying to encourage processes like Brexit and populism, try to undermine Euro-Atlantic solidarity through cyber means, through disinformation. Uh, and and uh, this, I think, level of cooperation between Russia and China is an increasing cause of concern for NATO. Now, of course, this shouldn't be overstated. If we look back at uh, history of Russia and China relations, we see all sorts of tensions between the two countries, the Sino-Soviet split during the Cold War. So I don't want to overstate this, but the fact that these two countries, I think, are cooperating more now presents a new and emerging challenge for NATO, which it needs to take seriously and through its, uh, again, doctrine and strategy
and, and the processes like uh, um, NATO 2030. Um, the other, um, I think, facet uh, of this, uh, and I'll probably just leave it here for now, is, is again to talk about NATO's global partners uh, in Asia. If we move to the question, um, why is it important for NATO to think about China or to think about the Asia Pacific more uh, into how they would do that? Um, what mechanisms are there for NATO to increasingly cooperate with Asia Pacific partners? Then we do have a foundation for that already. Uh, NATO um, uh, has for uh, a long time established this partners across the globe uh, mechanism group of countries, which includes partnership agreements with Australia, with New Zealand, uh, with Pakistan, with Afghanistan, with South Korea, with Japan, and most recently with Colombia. And this might be a kind of a, an unusual mix or group of countries, but there is a platform for cooperation with these countries there. Again, um, I was involved in a big research project where we did surveys in Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, Mongolia, uh, which is another partner across the growth uh, country and, and Japan. And what we found really was that there was a uh, there was still quite a strong strong um, uh, emphasis on those countries that they wanted to have a relationship with NATO. If we look at the maritime area, for example, the uh, upholding the maritime uh, global commons, that was seen as an important issue. Partnership agreements with New Zealand, for example, the country that I've been working in for the last fifteen years or so on cyber. Uh, I, I think is important. Countries like New Zealand want to have a relationship with NATO in the area of cyber and emerging technologies. Counterterrorism, of course, is a huge uh, issue um, that, that um, NATO has had uh, a quite significant role in the post 9-11 era. Uh, and that multilateral mechanism for combating terrorism, whether it's in Afghanistan or elsewhere, is something that these Asia Pacific countries have a particular uh, stake in and want a relationship with NATO in. So the good news is, if you like, we have a partnership mechanism there which could be built on, which could be rejuvenated, which could even be perhaps be extended to other countries um, in the in the Asia uh, Pacific region. Uh, we also have the Five Eyes platform, of course, which is well established, which includes Canada, the US, New Zealand, Australia uh, and the UK, um, which is another kind of platform for cooperation between some NATO members in the Asia Pacific. Um, and so the, the, the platform, I think, is there. And, if, and, and I think you know, my overall sort of takeaway from the initial comments and the argument would be that probably if NATO doesn't do this, if it doesn't think about rejuvenating these relationships, it's not going to be particularly well equipped to deal with these globalized security challenges, this nexus between um, uh, China and Russia's uh, strategic interests or indeed um, the increasing uh, uh, pattern of economic coercion, espionage, subversion that we're seeing these countries conducting within NATO's territory uh, itself. Um, so I'm very happy to expand on those points in the, in, in the comments. I think, again, this is an important time for NATO. NATO does need to take China and Asia more seriously, uh, and hopefully it will have the platform to, to do so. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Burton. Uh, for your initial comments, and I'm looking forward to uh, to certainly discussing some of those points further um, in the Q&A. Um, so now I would like to uh, pass the conversation over to Dr. Christina Lay. Um, so Dr. Lay is a junior research fellow in the Institute of Political Science at Acad Academia Sinica, Taiwan. Uh, she's also an adjunct lecturer in global security studies at John Hopkins University. She's interested in US-China relations, Chinese foreign policy, East Asian politics, and qualitative research methods. Her works have appeared in uh, the Politics Journal of Contemporary China, Pacific Review, International Relations of the Asia Pacific, Asian Survey, and uh, Asian Security. Uh, Dr. Lei, thank you so much for uh, being here with us today. Yes. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to share my thoughts on NATO-China relations. So my work proposed the question on whether an Asian NATO is a possibility. And I think that a, such an organization is conceivable, but it will be contingent on the closer tie between existing NATO members and partners in the Asia Pacific. And since the end of the World War II, the United States has established a hub and spoke system in East Asia and provided a security commitment to its ally. 
And the region, regional landscape in Asia has different from that of Europe, which features a formal alliance relations. However, uh, starting in 2010, the security dynamic in Asia has changed significantly. Um, China's military presence and its frequent use of economic coercion and against its neighbor has led to heated debates uh, about whether a NATO-like institution would be appropriate way to uh, counter China's growing influence in Asia and beyond. So my article in this policy report uh, engaged the previous uh, debates on why there is no NATO in Asia from the 2000s. And I explore the possibility of a NATO-like organization in the Asia Pacific, specifically during the era of uh, intense US-China uh, competition. And so essentially I argue that a NATO in Asia is a possibility given certain condition. For example, an Asian NATO would be feasible only if NATO member states actively share their experience uh, with policy makers and uh, scholars in Asia Pacific. Um, Asian country has begun to consider China's military rise and uh, assertiveness as uh, uh, increasing threat to the regional uh, stability. And I think more importantly, the formation of a NATO-like uh, organization in Asia would be mostly depends on uh, how much a security threat that China posed to the region, but also depends on how NATO member states can uh, engage with Asian country in, in a substantive cooperation. So uh, uh, the previous, the literature in international relations has indicated that uh, you know, the strong US leadership and uh, strong threat perception for um, uh, the Soviet Union and shared uh, democratic uh, identity have led to the success for NATO longevity. Uh, so in this case, a normative perspective has provided a convincing explanation as to the absence of such a security organization in Asia uh, because the regional interactions uh, in East and Southeast Asia, especially the history of colonizations has helped establish the norm of non-interventions and the idea of sovereignty in the post-war era. So the norm against the regional collective defense in Asia has constituted a crucial elements for the multilateral setting in Asian politics. And I think uh, the most important reason that a NATO-like organization could probably not going to work in Asia because the country in this region has held diverse views of political values. They had different views on regional integration. They also even percept, has different perception toward China. So although uh, NATO is probably not going to expand its uh, geographical reach uh, to Asia Pacific at this point, it is still you know, feasible or possible for the member state to consider broadening its institutional purpose to address the uh, security threats from China and Russia. So instead of uh, debating whether there should be an expansion or a reduction of NATO member country, I think a more practical way to uh, realize its role, role uh, here is to actively engage with country in uh, Asia Pacific and rather than talking about uh, expansion of membership. Uh, for example, I think the Enhanced uh, Opportunity Partner Program, so-called EOP, under the NATO mandate allows uh, member states to develop closer ties uh, with uh, East Asian country. Uh, for example, in 2014, the EOP program has included Australia, Jordan, and Sweden. And this kind of cooperation has fostered channel for information sharing and political consultation. So their participation has really set a great example for uh, a country in the Asia Pacific region to enhance cross-regional uh, dialogue and cooperation with uh, NATO members. So I think it is in NATO's interest to actively engage country in uh, Asia Pacific region and also develop a coordinated uh, strategy and toward an increasingly assertive China. And in this case, NATO could serve as a policy forum to address China's increasing presence in Asia, Africa, or even in the Middle East. So that country in Europe, in Asia can openly discuss their concern and, and uh, set up uh, their uh, policy priority. And 
I think uh, recently China assertiveness in East China Sea and South China Sea territorial dispute have really created worries and suspicion among its neighbors to Beijing's ambition. ambition. So at the same time, most of these Asian country has relied heavily on bilateral trade with China. I think this is also one of the reason why China's neighbor are reluctant to choose sides between the United States and China as they prefer to uphold positive relationship with, with these two powers. However, Beijing economic coercion, to, uh, for example, toward Japan, Philippines, and Norway has significantly increased China's threat perception among uh, Asian country. So while no single country alone, such as uh, Taiwan, Vietnam, Malaysia, will be as powerful as China economically or in terms of military capability, but a coordinated uh, regional-wise coalition uh, could probably serve as a really powerful leverage against China's capability. So uh, as to what I said before, if Asian country were to form a NATO-like organization, it could probably be different from the NATO created in, in a context of Cold War era. Uh, for one thing, the threats from the Soviet Union are quite different from those of China nowadays. I think the degree of economic interdependence between China and Asian country is far greater than that of European counterpart uh, with the Soviet Union in the Cold War era. So China's uh, military capability, economic scale has present a more complex challenge and opportunity for the United States and Asian country. So in the East, uh, in a, sorry, in the Southeast Asian context, uh, there are several a regional institution uh, uh, right now, such as APAC, ASEAN, ASEAN Plus Three, uh, the uh, RCEP, etc. Uh, there's already a several regional institutional in place. So uh, this, uh, if Asian uh, NATO were to implement successfully, need to really transform those existing multilateral institution and bilateral agreement into something more integrated uh, within this framework of collective uh, defense. And that is why I think NATO's engagement with a uh, country in East Asia or in Asia Pacific in general in, could really bring the a gap, uh, bridge the gap uh, across the European country and the uh, country uh, in Asia Pacific region to address China's challenge. So uh, looking forward, uh, what's really the prospect for uh, uh, the uh, NATO engagement in Asia? I think uh, while the prospect of an Asian NATO remain uncertain, the security condition might change you know, significantly if Beijing uh, decided to engage in confrontation or action toward China or in South China Sea. So I think the most fundamental challenge for NATO's engagement in Asia is really a strategic one. That is how to uh, avoid the spiral of hostility between China and its neighbor at a time when US-China power competition is already quite intense. If Beijing decided to apply economic coercion more frequently to its neighbors and more assertive in a maritime dispute in East Asia, then I think a NATO-like organization in Asia might be formed pretty soon to counter China's uh, assertiveness. And uh, that is why I think this is now especially the time uh, when the NATO active engagement would be great help to Asian country as its previous experiments in countering Russia aggression uh, will pro uh, provide a useful guidance for China's neighbors. And uh, specifically, uh, like I mentioned before, the EOP programs offers uh, a feasible way to develop exercise with Japan, South Korea and Philippines. Uh, there are also uh, security, US security allies in Asia. And I think NATO member states could also learn from the policy measure adopted by Asian country, and they can all develop a comprehensive strategy in addressing uh, China's challenge and opportunity. So that's just some thought of my, uh, my uh, thoughts on NATO's engagement in Asia, and I'm looking forward to more discussion later with all of you. Thank you. That's great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Dr. Lai. And uh, yes, we really appreciate uh, your comments on that. And um, I think the highlighting of um, the significance of kind of um, 
where NATO and where multilateralism fits kind of adjacent to, but also beyond this kind of US China dynamic, which is the main kind of opposition that is being discussed in a lot of the literature and certainly in a lot of the kind of popular media. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to, uh, to everyone kind of developing that conversation further um, as we go. Um, so now I'd like to introduce um, our third and final speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Philip Shetler Jones. Um, Dr. Shetler Jones is a consultant for the, um, and I have to apologize for to any Germans in the audience for the pronunciation that I'm about to try, um, but for the uh, the Deutsche Gesellschaft für International Zusammenarbeit. Uh, uh, again, I apologize. Um, working on uh, Europe-Asia security cooperation. He holds a PhD from the University of Sheffield in Japanese security policy and a master's in law and diplomacy from Tufts University, which he attended as a US-UK Fulbright scholar. During five years as an officer in the Royal Marine Commandos, he served as a peacekeeper in Bosnia. Um, he has subsequently worked as a political advisor, consultant and analyst, um, for the UK Ministry of Defense, the United Nations, uh, the European Union, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and led a team of civilian analysts in NATO at uh, SHAPE. Philip is a associate fellow at the Council on Geostrategy and writes in a private capacity. Uh, Dr. Shetler Jones, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me to contribute uh, for the written piece, but also this very uh, enjoyable uh, conference as well. Um, I'm just going to speak for a few minutes, but I'm looking forward to the exchange, so I'm going to keep it short and uh, encourage everyone watching to go and read uh, the details in the publication. So I think um, Picking up a bit on, on one of the points Joe made, we've had conversations before about out of area or out of business, about what NATO ought to do or ought not to do outside its uh, the geographic area defined in the NATO charter. I think this is, a, this is different. Uh, I say that because I think in the past, these conversations were um, more discretionary to a degree. You could debate whether or not NATO would determine that itself, whether to go out to uh, the Balkans in, in case of Kosovo or the partnerships programs, the enlargement process uh, pushed, pushed ahead like a bow wave. And then of course, Afghanistan. Um, I think what's different this time is this is non-discretionary because I think this is a systemic change to the environment in, uh, that NATO has never had before. So another way of putting that is during the Cold War, NATO enjoyed centrality really uh, in, in the Cold War confrontation. Although there was a hot war in Asia, uh, it was kept cold in Europe and the United States more or less pursued a Europe first approach to its Cold War strategy that, that made NATO central. I think that that's changed. Uh, that's already been articulated in the previous US national security strategy that the Indo-Pacific is the priority theater. It's uh, mentioned in the new interim statement by the Biden administration. You can see now the visits of the uh, senior administration officials uh, out of the gate. They're not coming to Europe, they're going to Asia, uh, going to a number of Asian countries. So in a way, NATO and Europe is decentered from the US and maybe you could even say global uh, framework of security confrontation in, in this period. So that poses NATO a really different set of questions about what, what it means for the alliance. Um, let's look at three factors. I, the first one I think is obviously the relationship between the US and, and the People's Republic of China. Uh, they are on a kind of collision course over a few issues. It, it, it seems pretty clear the People's Republic of China would like America out of the region. Uh, which it sees itself as central in and having a, having a constrained role because of the US alliance structure in Asia. Once it out of the South China Sea, uh, it, it, would, it would not like to see the alliances with South Korea and Japan continue to constrain its, its options. Uh, this is obviously confronting America with a dilemma it has to face, which is away from Europe. 
The second factor is the alignment or cooperation to some extent between Russia, NATO's main preoccupation, and China. So that, that leads to a number of, 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 of things that I'll, I'll talk about just briefly in a second. And the third one is there is a, a, a different uh, dynamic between the US and China and between Europe and China. Uh, or I could say between North America and China on the one hand and, and Europe more and China. Um, maybe there are, there, are more, there are more nuances than that, but I, I'm, I'm at the risk of simplifying it. Let me, let me tell you what I'm talking about. The European reaction to the rise of China is still uh, not gelled, right? We have, we have a mention of something called the Sinatra Doctrine, you know, do it my way. Uh, many senior leaders in Europe insisting they don't wish to make a choice between the US and China. They do not wish to see the emergence of two blocks and be part of that. Meanwhile, increasingly, the conversations coming from Washington are going more and more in this direction of forming uh, arrangements to respond to China as part of an alliance system. So while in Europe, we love to talk about alliances and multilateralism as goods, uh, the flip side of that is, you know, you, who sets the conditions for what those alliances are. So this poses a, a different dilemma for Europe, I think, than what we had in the Cold War and post-Cold War era when we talked about going out of area. And then as, as is put very well, I think, in, in uh, Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg's writings about the NATO 2030 project, it's also about China coming to NATO's area rather than NATO making a a choice to go out or not. It's China is already there, is, is I think the, the very um, clear message from, from the Secretary General's narrative on this. So it sets a test of relevance for NATO in, in some areas. Like we, we mentioned, Joe mentioned the 5G issue where, uh, you know, can you stand by and not take a choice? Uh, can you make that part of the alliance solidarity that you come together on these questions? Uh, it's a test of the, you know, the constitutional relevance of NATO, whether it can cover issues like industry areas like 5G, or whether it's, it's stuck more in its familiar comfort zone of defense and security issues. Um, it, it sets another test in terms of some of the technologies uh, that will be receiving more investment to, to face China. So that China will become the pace setting, if it isn't already, the pace setting technology leader in, in defense. And there could be a gap opening up between the countries who are taking China as their, as their pace setter and those who either don't wish to or, or can't for reasons of cost. So that will also um, force difficult questions on the alliance. So second, the China-Russia. This can, this can uh, risk uh, adding another complication to what's already a difficult moment for, for NATO. So NATO is, I think, being pulled in three directions at the moment. There's the traditional orientation towards Russia, and, and many of the countries in Central Eastern Europe and the Baltics are thinking about Russia when they think about NATO. France is more and more talking about uh, looking at a different direction and saying Russia is, is no longer an enemy. Uh, for the alliance in the way that it was in the time of the Soviet Union. The true enemy is Islamist militancy and, and, and uh, that, that originates from Africa and from the Middle East. And so France is trying to put a uh, reorientation of the alliance uh, on the table. And then we have the one we're talking about here, Asia and China. So this, um, in a way, I think it could go either way. The, the discussion about China can help bind the alliance together on some issues. If Europe and the US and Canada and the other members feel that there is common ground in some issues that we want to have in common in how we approach China. Um, but at the same time, it can be divisive uh, if there is a critical mass of countries who want to take an independent uh, direction in the way that they relate to China. And that will be exposed pretty soon, I think, this year. We have elections in France. We have elections, sorry, we have elections in Germany this year, in France early next year. And I expect this is very much on the table. So third, last point, uh, as I said, this idea of China is coming to the NATO area. Yes, through the Arctic, 
uh, yes, also through Africa, which is another uh, interesting twist in the dynamic I mentioned with the French perspective. In some ways, China can be helpful in uh, some of the ambitions that, 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 that France has in that, and, and the Mediterranean members of the alliance have in terms of stabilizing Africa and economic growth in Africa. Um, but I think predominantly for most of the European allies, China is coming in an economic form. It's not felt as coming much in a military or defense uh, threat form. Uh, although there have been Chinese exercises uh, in the European area, you see more and more Chinese vessels appearing. Obviously, you have the presence of China in, in cyberspace and outer space. And as those um, domains uh, get more attention, that will probably increase. But I think that's, that's the other sense in which this is a fundamental challenge for NATO, because uh, the, as, as, um, as um, Christina mentioned, the rivalry in this case is bound up with uh, economic and technological rivalry, uh, almost more than a military rivalry over territory. Uh, comparing it to the, the the previous Cold War, and so for NATO that is somewhat unfamiliar ground, and does I I I, I think NATO is going to um, have an interesting experience trying to uh, either parcel those those parts of the relationship off onto other institutions and, and frameworks, or whether it takes a role in some of some of these questions. And as some of these issues like the defense technologies issues, pooling resources, common research and development, interoperability also get tested um, if uh, countries go in, in different directions from, from more or less we had um, alignment in, the, in the, the Cold War period facing the USSR. So they're my three areas of thoughts. I'm eager to go over to the conversation. So. I'm just going to um, cut myself off there and hand back the floor. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Dr. Shetler Jones, for your comments. Um, and I am also very, uh, very much looking forward to opening up the conversation. Um, so I will do that. Um, so I do just want to note as well for those in the audience um, that if you are interested in reading more, um, each of the three presenters here has developed these thoughts kind of in greater depth within the publication itself. Um, so we have posted a link to that in the chat um, within, uh, you should see it there if you're watching on YouTube. Um, so do uh, certainly give that a read if you're interested in kind of going uh, deeper into it. Um, for now, though, we will uh, continue the conversation. Um, and so uh, to do that, we'll start with the, um, the structured Q&A. Um, and although I say structured, I do also encourage, um, you know, it to be kind of uh, dynamic and organic. So certainly do feel free to kind of, uh, you know, take the ball and run with it if there's a direction that uh, any of the three of you really like to take things and especially if you have um, any comments on uh, anything any of the other presenters have said as well. Um, so I certainly, um, I will be asking some questions of our own from the NATO Association, but I do really encourage you also to, um, you know, to kind of, uh, kind of take that and do with it what you will. Um, so the first uh, question and the first kind of uh, big theme uh, that I think comes through here, um, and that I think all of you have kind of um, given some initial thoughts about, but that I'd like to kind of push further and develop further, um, is a question that I'm sure that for many in our audience uh, who are kind of uh, approaching this from the orientation of NATO, um, the question I think on a lot of people's minds is how then should NATO um, approach the rise of China? Is this, um, you know, each of you has given a lot of very kind of uh, nuanced and complex answers on this. And so I don't think there is kind of one simple answer um, to the question, but in terms of thinking about this um, in practical terms and what all of these different uh, factors will mean going forward, um, uh, how will NATO kind of balance these varying visions of what China is, um, especially given what, you know, each of you has kind of fleshed out in different ways in terms of the importance of multilateralism, different perspectives, whether these are different perspectives coming from NATO members uh, within Europe versus 
uh, North America, as Dr. Burton mentioned, or within Europe itself in terms of uh, kind of the North African versus Russian versus Asian orientation uh, that Dr. Shetler Jones just spoke about. And then as well, thinking about the diversity of perspectives within Asia and specifically within Southeast Asia, India, um, and uh, Japan and um, Korea, as uh, Dr. Lei was talking about. So um, it, I guess what I'm getting at is that, um, you know, given this uh, kind of huge challenge of the fact that there are all of these different strands here, um, how can we start to think about um, how those can be, um, I guess, brought together in productive ways or in coherent ways, um, or what are, um, you know, certainly that's a big question, but what would be, you know, some initial steps that um, could begin um, to facilitate uh, such an approach by NATO? Was that question directed at any any one of us in particular or no for uh for the panel yeah um, yeah as a whole. well perhaps I, i'll start i mean i, I think um i, I guess that there's a there's a, a way of looking at um uh, what might happen as we move forward kind of in a, in a in a grand structural sense and then also on on a sort of issue by issue basis um for the alliance i mean i i think that you know, if you, uh, I'm not, I'm not a, a realist or a neo-realist, but that kind of school of thought, I think, really suggests that you know the U.S. is in relative decline in the international system. Uh, Europe is uh, struggling at the moment uh, because of popul populism and, and Brexit, <coughs> and and these dynamics actually present um, reasons for NATO um, to continue and to be a cohesive actor in international affairs given the rise of China, given its cooperation with Russia, um, the transatlantic alliance, in my view, has never been so important. Um, and I think um, whether that's recognized in every NATO capital or not, I, I, you know, I don't know. Um, but but that, that is my assessment of the grand structural dynamic um, <clears throat> and why NATO needs to, to, to you know, step forward and, and deal with um, with this changing um, polarity, if you like, in, in, in international affairs. Um, if you approach it, though, on a more issue um, sort of led basis, I think that that provides avenues where, um, you know, groups of NATO countries might be able to take forward their cooperation or contestation vis-a-vis -vis China, um, or indeed um, might provide avenues to involve specific, again, Asia-Pacific partners in this. Um, you know, there is some potential, I think, for cooperation with China um, in some areas. Climate change, I think, probably is the most obvious of those. I think China shares uh, huge concerns about that with NATO members, with the United States, and we need to do something about that. That inevitably uh, and invariable, uh, invariably will involve China. You know, again, pandemic response is, is an issue um, that, that needs closer cooperation and collaboration for both uh, parties' sake. But I think um, I'm hardening and becoming a little bit more pessimistic in a load of other issue areas on which you know, we could move forward with a, either a more collaborative um, relationship with China or, or the other, or otherwise, Afghanistan, for example, and counterterrorism. I think China's actions in the Xinjiang pro, pro, uh, province, the way it's dealt, dealt with its Uyghur population, has really put paid to any meaningful cooperation between China and NATO on terrorism, particularly Islamic terrorism. Um, on cyber. Um, you know, there were attempts by the Obama administration to come to an agreement with China about cyber, commercial cyber espionage, and China just kind of went ahead and um, carried on, uh, so to speak. Um, artificial intelligence, we know China is determined to forge ahead in this field, uh, and that will ine inevitably, I think, be a competitive area. Uh, maritime, can we cooperate with China on maritime? We'll look at what China, China's done in the South and East China Sea, militarizing the South and East China Sea, putting in place air defense identification zones, becoming much more assertive about who does travel through its near uh, region. Um, I think, again, um, this doesn't bode well for cooperation with China. And again, that presents an opportunity for NATO to work with 
uh, Japan, India, other countries in the region to make sure those maritime commons uh, are protected. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, in a structural sense, there's very much a need for NATO to coalesce on these, these on, on the issues. But when you look at particular issue areas like that, and that probably includes economics and trade as well, uh, the prospects aren't particularly good at the moment um, for, for collaboration with China. And again, this, this, I think, presents more reasons and more evidence as to why NATO really should be working with like-minded countries in the region to try and bolster and reassert some of these uh, kind of rules-based um, uh, norms and, and protocols. I'm not sure whether that answered your question directly, sure, but, thank but you. I mean, it's, it's, it's a overly huge question um, that probably we can't answer. Maybe if we have another 10, uh, 10 round tables, we can do it. Um, so uh, Dr. Lay and Dr. Uh, Shetler Jones, do either of you have a, um, any response to that? Yeah, Dr. Shetler Jones. Uh, I think NATO and NATO allies should look at uh, influencing China's outlook on the world, which is, which is changing fast. And, and we've seen a huge change, I think, under Premier Xi Jinping. Um, there was a very interesting insight into uh, their worldview uh, called Seeing Things China's Way by Nigel Inkster, the IISS. And this is a picture of uh, an outlook where there are, there are a few things that, have, that seem to be really embedded in the, the belief of the Chinese leadership, that China is rising, the West is declining, and that, and that this is the opportunity to rejuvenate China and, and restore it to its proper place. Um, I'm not sure I, I buy that. I think that, that there is going to be a period of uh, continued rise driven by economic dynamism in China and technological achievement. Uh, then there is going to be a plateauing and potentially a falling off of growth and even um, some problems that come from the demographic pressures that China will have to face. Uh, and if that is added to by Cold War-like containment pressures, then that, that becomes even more difficult. And then you have all of the potential problems of how somebody explains to the Chinese people how their, 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 new, their new golden age never arrived and who's to blame for that. So I think we have um, two or maybe three difficult decades to get through. So I think uh, the way we should approach China from NATO is to try and influence that worldview and um, shape it uh, through deterrence and shape it through uh, other understandings of the balance of, of legitimate sovereign interests in the world where um, China is going to rise and that's fine, but certain kinds of behavior are not acceptable. And that's not just something that countries care about when their neighbors do it. That's something where we have a global uh, consensus with, with many countries. Uh, some of them share the same political system, but not all. Uh, many of them are democracies, but not all but mostly they are countries who care about uh, their sovereignty and not being bullied or told what to do. And so I think that is the most powerful thing NATO can do is reinforce the message that that is a, a sort of near universal um, factor that, that China's rise will have to um, steer around and, and be accommodated within. Um, it will be difficult in some ways, I think, because I'm not sure China sees NATO as a legitimate counterpart for the conversation. China is, is generally against alliances. Uh, it shares with Russia a view that uh, there is something about alliances like NATO, which is contrary to the spirit and intention of the design of the, the UN charter-based international system, which is one where you know, issues of defense and security should be addressed through the UN not through groupings of countries who are excluding some and welcoming others. So I think as members of NATO, we'll be able to deal with China on some of these conversational topics about worldview. But, but I think, uh, you know, we shouldn't go in assuming that China wants to talk to NATO. Let's put it that way. I'm not sure that we have any, any reliable signals that that's the case. Thank you. Sure. That's a good point. Uh, Dr. Lai, do you have any, uh, response? Yes. Uh, first of all, I think uh, uh, 
Dr. Jones has really laid out a really good point about China, the rise of China and its influence on its neighbor. Uh, here, I, I, I would like to highlight there are, uh, you know, uh, in, my, in my view, there will be a two major challenge for uh, possible NATO engage, engagement in Asia Pacific. The first one is that NATO itself is uh, experienced, need to uh, over, overcome its uh, institutional, the challenge for its institutional purpose and a process to uh, redefine its identity. I think NATO member state has been engaged in ongoing debate regarding whether NATO should focus on solely on European collective defense or whether it should broaden its uh, strategic outlook institutional purpose to a, a wider geographical reach. So at this point, I think there is still a, a lack of consensus on, on NATO's uh, scope and its uh, identity and its purpose. So I think there's a high degree of uncertainty about the, uh, the future of NATO. And that also related to how how NATO as a, a collective uh, security organization could uh, you know, effectively engage uh, a country in Asia Pacific and how it could draw a roadmap uh, for a NATO engagement in Asia. And uh, the second point is that it is also quite challenging uh, if NATO decided to uh, engage country in, in Asia Pacific. Uh, specifically, I think the memory of European colonialism in Asia is still quite strong. And there's a doubts and suspicions uh, for NATO's, you know, presumably military presence in this region. And I, th I think that's something that would be seen as, uh, could be an escalation of tension from Chinese perspective, or it could be seen as a uh, 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 re-emergion of uh, European colonialism uh, in, in uh, Asian country. So at, at the same time, you know, in Europe, there are also different uh, threat perception or different perception of China. Uh, for example, uh, maybe the e Eastern uh, European country, there could be more, more worry about uh, Russia's influence. They would prefer NATO to put more resource to their own defense. Uh, whereas uh, some uh, country in the Mediterranean area, they're concerned about in instability in the MENA region. So there's a divided uh, view on how to, uh, you know, uh, how to uh, view China. And also there's a divided view of how the, the, on the institutional purpose on NATO itself. Um, so that thing, I think there's a, that is the two main challenge for uh, NATO future engagement with Asia. So I think uh, but there's still a possible way for Asia, for NATO uh, member state, if they want to address China's challenge here. I think it has option for strengthening its ties and activity uh, in Asia Pacific, but NATO has to do it in a careful and incremental uh, manner. And China is unlikely to welcome increased NATO involvement uh, in its neighborhood. So I think essentially NATO needs to strike a careful balance between uh, strengthening ties with Asian country and avoid uh, antagonizing uh, China in the long run. Sure, thank you. Yes, Dr. Britton. Yeah, in, the, in the spirit of the conversation, I'm wondering whether I might just kind of add add on to um, um, to, to what uh, um, Philip and Christina have said, because I think they're really important and in interesting points. Um, on, on shaping China's worldview, um, I, I don't know, I guess I feel that that from from I kind of some anecdotal experiences I've had and, and uh, that, that that might be harder to do than maybe we think it, it might be. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, we've sort of had this strategy over the last 20, 30 years to try and sort of integrate China into kind of the rules based international order uh, and, and sort of socialize it to the admittedly, you know, US led institutions that have been set up after 1945 in the hope that they would, you know, come round and their human rights um, uh, situation would improve and that they politically liberalize as has happened in some countries in the post Cold War era, but I'm not sure that's happened. And I, and I think if you look, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a China expert, look, but if I, from, 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 from looking at China, it seems it's become probably more ideological, more centralized, more committed to party doctrine, um, 
uh, over the last decade or so, and, and the Communist Party in China has really been increasing its its, its power. And I, and I don't think that that's a necessarily makes um, makes for a particularly maulable world uh, a view. And and the anecdotal experience I've had, um, and this might get me in trouble with my university, but but. Um, we, we've, I've had quite a lot of Chinese students in my classes over the last um, five, six years in, in New Zealand. Um, and um, I, I sort of, you know, they're, they're, they're amazing and, and lovely young people, but there's a lot of indoctrination that goes on in China. And they come to New Zealand really having bought into the Chinese worldview and, and some of them really quite resistant and resilient too. Um, you know, open debates uh, about international affairs. And, and what I've particularly seen, I think, in the last few years is uh, increasingly Chinese students in, in New Zealand um, actually quite concerned about giving their point of view um, for fear that they might be reported on back to the authorities in, in Beijing. There's a sense of, of kind of, um, you know, cultural coercion or imperialism going on here, which I think is extremely um, concerning. Um, and and um, so so I, I guess uh, you know I, I, I sort of greet this idea that maybe their worldview is capable of <clears throat> of changing or being influenced maybe a little bit more um, uh, skeptically. Um, the 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 UN um, was also mentioned, which I think is a, is a really important point. Um, and I and I think you know certainly there's again room for cooperation through the UN system. But what I would perhaps also say is that. I think probably um, China is increasingly seeing the institutions that it has created as an alternative for it to achieve its political aims, whether that's the Belt and Road Initiative or the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or the Shanghai Corporation Organization. These are uh, institutional mechanisms internationally, um, which I think China is trying to create so that it can shape um, the world order uh, you know, towards its national interests. So, so I think uh, you know the UN is important, but we shouldn't you know perhaps uh, underemphasize some of the other uh, institutional mechanisms through which China is working. And again, those perhaps also present opportunities again for NATO uh, members and partners. And 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 again, you know, I, I would really um, you know commend and agree with Christina's point on on this idea of colonialism. I think you know the last thing the Vietnamese want to see is more French involvement in Southeast Asia. The last thing the Singaporeans want to see is more British involvement in Southeast Asia. Um, but I think that, that that doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't avenues for cooperation on, on issues where there's collective interest. Um, look, I'm incredibly aware of, of the history of, of, of uh, British and European colonialism in Asia. I've spent a lot of time in the ASEAN region over the last three or four years. This kind of regularly comes up. I always feel quite, you know, self-conscious as a as a British person talking to Southeast Asian audiences about about um, you know issues that they should be concerned with. But um, I, I think that there's certainly room uh, and scope for for greater cooperation between NATO and some of the Southeast Asian countries on specific issues. Singapore, for example, is becoming a leading country in the region in cyber security. Um, you know, what, the, surely there is some scope for information sharing on cyber threats between NATO and Singapore, for example, especially as they're emanating from, from China. Um, so we have a complicated history, but that doesn't necessarily need to be a barrier to kind of cooperation in niche areas, maybe. Sure. And I think that one theme that comes out uh, really in what all of you have been discussing too is it's also, um, you know, we can't overlook the, um, the worldview, obviously, that is um, kind of uh, prevalent within China, but also the role of uh, Western countries, Western uh, political administrations, Western journalists, whoever else in also impacting that worldview, right, through the way that we discuss the issues and the kinds of language that we deploy in talking about China. I think it's um, in the same way as, um, you know, there is a huge degree of sensitivity that's required in terms of understanding the colonial legacies in the region and then responding appropriately and reaching out appropriately um, in ways that recognize that and that don't kind of um, rejuvenate those concerns of uh, European or American imperialism. Um, I think in the same way, um, and uh, then I'll, I'll also uh, kind of uh, 
uh, hand it back over to Dr. Shetler Jones in a moment. Um, but in terms of uh, your own point about um, China's worldview, um, and uh, you know, certainly taking on board, uh, Dr. Burton, uh, your skepticism in terms of our ability to actually shape that. Um, but at the same time, I think there is value in thinking about what kind of ammunition we're providing for it, or what kind of role we ourselves may be playing, you know, maybe not in a way where we can actually um, shape that worldview in a kind of more direct sense, but thinking about how the ways that um, our leadership or our press or different other institutions um, might also be, you know, playing a role in shaping uh, that worldview in uh, maybe in less direct ways and maybe thinking about that um, as a potential option. Um, but I do also want to uh, give uh, Dr. Shetler Jones a chance to respond. Thanks. Well, I agree. I think the influencing, uh, it would be nice if it came from conversations and uh, the kind of things we can do in universities and in education. I think it's more likely to come from uh, behavior and signaling. And as, as, as you just said, Joe, I mean, it's, it's, it's how we act in ways that either appear to confirm that worldview or make that worldview a little bit less convincing or, or, or give, give pause to people uh, who say, well, the reality doesn't conform to that worldview. You know, things, things are not that simple. Um, and that's about uh, having the courage of our convictions and, and, and actually, um, you know, walking the walk as well as uh, talking the talk when it comes to our principles. And, and I think that that, that that power of example is underestimated at the moment in the West because there is a kind of collective sense of being a bit off balance. Um, and as I say, there are, there, you know, there are different views about even how coherent a concept like the West uh, or the Western sort of way of viewing the world is. Uh, so I think uh, it, will be, it will be done by example and by action uh, that will signal the meaning of, 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 of what we're saying and thinking rather more than, than some persuasion, which you may be right, uh, Joe, that it's becoming harder to have these discussions openly. Although I would say as well, um, talking about the degree to which China and China's worldview can change, compare the situation today with 10 years ago or 20 years ago in China. And then just, you know, imagine if we have the same uh, rate of change, but maybe going in a different direction. I mean, the current leadership in China isn't going to be there forever. There will be uh, a new leadership sooner or later. I mean, look at the, the dramatic change of the Deng Xiaoping era and, and how that set China on a completely different direction. Look at the Nixon-Deng uh, agreement in the Cold War. So uh, it's, not a, it's not like an oil tanker that will just go on in one direction um, indefinitely. Uh, China changes direction. It's done so before and uh, you know, we can expect it to do so again. So I think uh, we, should, we should not be too um, resigned to uh, China being uninfluenceable. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Lei, I just wonder if you have any uh, comments that you'd like to, um, uh, to give in response to the conversation. Yes, uh, I guess I think uh, uh, Dr. Burton and uh, uh, Philip Jones has really, uh, really kind of uh, brought up a really good point about uh, whether NATO or the West can influence China's worldview or not. Uh, I think uh, it, we're talking about the, the whether we can change of China's worldview as if uh, as if China's worldview has been constant or not. Actually, uh, like Dr. Jones said, you know, China's worldview can be changed, right? And at the same time, if China's, you know, or for example, like. Uh, uh, Mao or Deng, uh, you know, uh, the their change of their tenure has really uh, uh, proposed a different change for foreign policy than the West or uh, the other East Asian country can also uh, change their perception toward China. So I, I think in that sense, uh, uh, the change of perception is a two-way street, right? China 
may change because uh, the perception of the West uh, also change, uh, you know, uh, as China uh, powers uh, rise and fall uh, through, uh, through time. So in that case, I, 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 I will think it's a, a dynamic process. And as to how the West or European community can really uh, shape China preference, I think there are already some uh, policy analysis uh, yeah, that argue that NATO should pretty uh, should upgrade its relation with China, or kind of even creating a kind of NATO China uh, Council, the similar to NATO Russia Council, and and I and I and I think uh, that's that's a possibility, but I don't really see that uh, NATO uh, China Council would take take into shape any soon. I think NATO has, China have been engaged in dialogue for quite some times, but so far there's uh, been limited result. And I, I don't really see that NATO and China can and can come into some kind of substantive uh, cooperations uh, in the near future. So I think the, the maybe more uh, a feasible way is to ch for NATO to engage you know, engage with China's neighbors or country in uh, uh, Asian Pacific uh, country first. Uh, as you know, Southeast Asia is a region full of different kind layers of institution, right? And at the same time, China also actively involved in those uh, layer institution like ASEAN plus three and East Asia summit. So uh, by engaging in the multilateral institution uh, in Southeast Asia, you know, NATO, NATO member state can also get into know China better and also get into how East Asian, Southeast Asian country uh, view China so that we can foster kind of a, a positive, positive dy dynamic of understanding China, understanding China's neighbor, and in the end, understand uh, what's the most important identity, what's the value of NATO is all about. Just very briefly to add to that, uh, ju just very, very briefly, um, one of the other things that NATO do does, does have is a public diplomacy division. And I think in an in a era where um, NATO's role is often be being mischaracterized by hostile actors and adversaries, I think, um, you know, one of the things that NATO could do is rejuvenate the public diplomacy division, put more uh, resources into it and seek to more aggressively counter some of these anti-NATO narratives that there are out there. Uh, you know, I've been in sort of track 1.5 meetings with Chinese academics in in um, in New Zealand. And the first thing they, they mentioned when you talk to them about NATO is the bombing of the Chinese embassy in, in Kosovo in, 19, in, in Serbia in 1999. And it's... Uh, you know that that narrative needs to change, right? Um, uh, and and particularly Russia are putting out um, sort of very negative images of, of of NATO and its role in the world, be it in Afghanistan or elsewhere. And I think um, NATO can do something about that. I'd like to just um, add to something uh, I I like that uh, Christina just said about the. Uh, talking the benefit of talking to nato's partners in east and southeast asia um, and i think that there's a there's a very uh fruitful exercise to be done there in in spending more more time uh, engaging with our our partners and hearing from them what kind of value their nato partnership brings to them in their regional uh, challenges uh with their with their neighbors uh, and, and, and what kind of benefit the history and example of NATO might be uh, as some kind of a, a reference point. I'm not, I'm not sure that model would be the right word, uh, but uh, as a reference point to how countries can develop networking and, and, and cooperation mechanisms, but also mechanisms like deconfliction and some of these practices that were evolved uh, with great, great uh, value, I think, in the confrontation with the Soviet Union um, that could, you know, be, be useful in some ways in thinking about how to manage this, this dangerous period in the region. And so that kind of almost diplomatic technical level uh, exchange and experience could also be one uh, that, that's of interest. But again, I think it's something that we, 
we probably need to ask and, and sit quietly and, and, and hear from them as much as taking an agenda to that region. Thank you. Sure, yeah, I think uh, that uh, is a really important point. Um, and uh, yeah, actually kind of uh, did address part of what uh, um, we had been intending to ask about this question, kind of about uh, Southeast Asian organizations and uh, their own kind of um, perceptions of NATO and of China. Um, one interesting thing that I observed recently was that um, I've been following the uh, protests in Myanmar uh, quite closely, and um, there have been um, a lot of really fascinating things coming out of the kind of uh, the messaging and the symbolism and the different uh, kind of ways that the protesters have been uh, comporting themselves and kind of looking to establish um, not only legitimacy against the uh, the uh, military regime and the Tatmadaw, uh, but also uh, really using kind of um, international symbols as well. So there's this kind of famous use of uh, the Hunger Games salute, which we also saw in Thailand. Um, but one thing that's interesting and kind of why I bring it up in relation to this conversation um, is that I have seen a number actually of images of protesters carrying uh, pro NATO signs, um, which is, uh, I think, really interesting because, of course, um, you know, NATO intervention in Myanmar is not on the table really, you know, by any measure. Um, but I, it is interesting to me that this is something that at least some of the protesters are kind of thinking of in terms of a reference point and in terms of a, um, you know, thinking about uh, that relationship to, um, uh, to Western countries, to the larger international system. Um, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, to mention that. Um, so I do want to make sure that we have uh, time to move on to our audience questions as well. Um, so I think let's open it up to there. And then, I mean, certainly though, I really do like the kind of uh, the back and forth and the fact that everyone is really kind of engaged with each other's points. So certainly do feel free to continue doing that. Um, but I think it would be good if we do open it up uh, to see what some of the members of the audience have been, uh, have been uh, wondering about as well. Um, so Emilio, uh, do you want to um, just uh, maybe let us know some of those uh, questions? Great, uh, thank you, Dr. McQuaid. I'll, I'll be taking questions from our YouTube live chat box. Uh, so for those watching at home, uh, please feel free to ask your questions and I'll do my best to get to them. Uh, so this first question is directed to Dr. Shetler Jones. Um, you spoke about three domains that NATO is being pulled into. Uh, is there a concern that NATO is being spread too thin across these domains? And also, is there a concern that NATO members will be too hesitant to expand beyond NATO's traditional sphere? Yes and yes, I think so. Uh, okay, it cuts both ways. I think NATO is revitalized by these periodic discussions. As, as I think Joe mentioned, it's been more than 10 years since our last strategic review. The Secretary General is very keen to do another. It's a good way of kind of airing these different points of view and structuring them into a, usually, we, you know, we get a pretty close to consensus kind of agreement decision. Uh, and sometimes there are some initiatives that, are, that are, end up much smaller than they started off, um, but other ones really develop important uh, life as part of the NATO infrastructure. So yes, I think there is an issue of being spread too thin, but I would say it's not a concern. I think at the moment it's, it's a productive thing because we are going through this, one of these cycles of, of re, refocusing NATO and it's high time. There've been uh, more than enough events happened since the last strategic review uh, to, to merit uh, refocusing now, especially coming to the Biden administration, as, as Joe said, coming out of a few operations uh, and coming into debates like uh, European strategic autonomy. So um, can you repeat the second part of the question, please? Uh, is there some concern that NATO members will be too hesitant to expand beyond NATO's traditional sphere? Well, it's a concern. I guess it's a concern for people who think it should be, and it's a, a reassurance for those who think uh, actually 
the challenges NATO has in its region have have not gone away. They haven't gone down. Uh, and in some ways, uh, they may be harder to face. Because the other thing we haven't mentioned is the latent effects on the defense capability of uh, downward pressure on defense budgets. There could be less money to go around for defense spending and other kinds of spending that are relevant for NATO defense and, and effectiveness, even for the, you know, the most pressing immediate local threats. So um, the figures look good because you compare defense spending to GDP when GDP is going down, uh, that looks nice. But uh, when you look at the capabilities that are wanted, even coming out of what we decided the last time we had the, you know, our strategic review, um, I think there is an issue there. So uh, I don't think NATO will be going out that much, but I think it will be doing more of taking account of the rise of China, taking account of the shift of global center of gravity to Asia. Uh, and, and that is uh, something that I think most members, you know, members of the alliance will want to see. Uh, and, they, and, and it doesn't draw on the same kind of resources that will be needed for the more local regional uh, priorities. So I think it's, it's, it's not too much of a concern. I think it's, it's, it's something that can be re reconciled. And uh, before moving to the next question, I would like to make sure that uh, Dr. Lai and Dr. Burton um, have the opportunity to respond or elaborate. Um, yeah, just briefly. I mean, if we're talking about sort of domains, land, sea, air, space, cyber, you know, and NATO's role in those, uh, you know, I'd note that NATO has been doing stuff in cyber since 1999, since, since the, again, the Kosovo conflict when it, when its own digital infrastructure was affected by cyber <clears throat> attacks from... Uh, Serbian and Chinese hackers, by the way. So it's had a long role in the cyber domain. Um, there are, uh, you know, there's a long history in in NATO in, in terms of missile defense and space-based systems as well. So I think probably they've already expanded <clears throat> into some of the new domains, and they've also also I think had quite a long history now of of going out of area. I mean, I, th I think the in area out of area distinction is somewhat bogus um, because of globalization. But um, you know, we've we've done maritime operations in in o o off the the coast of africa anti-piracy missions we've been in afghanistan um but whether there's a hesitancy now to again you know think about or re-engage with china there might be and there probably is in some european capitals but i think it very much needs to happen and dr Lai, if you'd like to respond uh, yes i I think uh, both of them had really uh, t t touch on, on a specific issue area or kind of the broader uh, outlook of whether NATO uh, should stick to uh, its traditional sphere influence or getting uh, ex expansion. But I, I think the the bottom line is that NATO has been, you know, will always been an uh, organization that focus on uh, collective defense in, in North Atlantic area. But at the same time, uh, we're also living in a world where, uh, you know, non-traditional threat has trans transcend the traditional territory or land border. Uh, therefore, it is a really uh, a critical time to think more carefully or uh, how, how would NATO or how would a European country uh, address uh, China's rise and challenges and its implication to a country in the Asia Pacific region. So I think NATO really has a potential to be the framework for its member states to kind of talk about China's uh, growing presence in Euro-Atlantic region. And to that, I, I'm specifically referring to uh, China's uh, economic influence or China's uh, getting this technology to its involvement to a 3G network. I think NATO in this sense can really help the alliance members and country in, uh, in, East, uh, in East Asia to establish kind of common approach to address China's technological challenge and economic, growing economic influence. So on a practical level, I think the reg regular uh, consultation or dialogue will probably provide uh, allies and partners uh, with better awareness, uh, situational awareness, security awareness about uh, uh, the, the 
possible evolving threats uh, from China's and Russia's influence or coercion so that uh, a country in Europe and uh, Asia, they could really uh, develop maybe in the future to develop a coordinated response. They could be especially important to uh, Im improve the efficiency to respond to a possible uh, hybrid, hybrid warfares or uh, NATO and its partner could also do better job to prepare for uh, uh, coordinated uh, communication or coordinated response to uh, cyber defense or fighting the disinformation com campaign from China and Russia. Thank you for the insightful response. I have one more question, and it'll be our final question. I just ask that the responses be brief as we are pressed for time. Uh, my last question is open to all the panelists, and it asks, should NATO be worried about increased Sino-Russian cooperation? And is this cooperation overstated? I don't mind um, going, going first on this. I think NATO should be very attentive to it because it, it, will, it will have real effects on uh, defense planning for the alliance and also some of the decisions that have to be taken about what to invest in in the longer term. So in some areas uh, such as um, space, missile technology, um, propulsion, stealth and so on, and then domain wise also the arctic as it as, as it loses the ice cover i think that uh the partnerships between china and russia will be it will be a, a growing factor in how nato allies make a threat appreciation of russia's capabilities um but on the other hand i think strategically uh in the longer term natural flaws and tensions will will arise between Russia and China. So I'm, I'm skeptical about the idea that it, it will form a kind of Eurasian alliance uh, off in the future. I think there are several reasons we probably don't have time to go into here um, why there are there are some incompatibilities there. So I think Russia will want to keep its freedom of, of choice to the to the greatest extent it can. Thank you. Yes, uh, very briefly, I, I keep saying very briefly and then talking for ages, which is a habit of academics that we uh, try and get out of. But uh, very briefly, um, yes, I do think we should be concerned, not least because I think both countries have, unfortunately, an interest in trying to drive a wedge between the transatlantic partners. Uh, a, a divided NATO is in the interests of Russia and China. Uh, so that's why I think we should be concerned about it. Um, and... If someone was clever and sure there are lots of clever people out there, especially working in NATO, um, I think maybe people should be thinking about how to exploit the Russia-China relationship as we've done historically and maybe insert some wedges in that relationship um, in, a, in a way, of course, that respects human rights and international law. I'll end on that controversial note. <laughs> Yes, uh, as to the um, uh, prospect of China-Russia uh, relations, uh, I think I'll probably uh, be uh, keeping some, uh, giving my own assessment that is kind of somewhere in between, between the overly good one or a pessimistic one. Because uh, uh, I think there is certainly a uh, uh, way or issue area that China and Russia can really uh, improve. Uh, or advance their national interests. But I think there is also uh, limits as to how much China can and, and, and Russia can really develop into some, something that really substantive uh, bilateral relation. So I would, ask, I would really say that uh, NATO or European countries should not be overly, overly alarmist about uh, US, Ch uh, sorry, China, Russia relation. But at, a, at the same time, we, uh, a U European country should not be underestimate uh, the possibility of the, these two countries getting closer uh, if, if the US China rivalry get more intense over time. So uh, I think US uh, China Russia relations still evolving and um, the future remain uncertain. So I think the best way for NATO 
uh, member state or European country right now is to really keep an uh, e even-handed assessment uh, about how NATO uh, should really keep on its really institutional purpose as a collective security uh, organization uh, in uh, uh, trans-Atlantic region. At the same time, try to starting to engage uh, with the China's neighbors uh, to foster a positive, uh, productive dialogue with China's neighbor in, in uh, Asia Pacific and not to overly antagonize China. Thank you to all our panelists for their wonderful responses. I think this is something that we're definitely all going to be monitoring in the coming years. Uh, with that being said, I pass it to our president, Robert Baines, for closing remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Emilio. Uh, I would like to offer my thanks uh, to all of our panelists, Dr. Lai, Dr. Shetler Jones, and Dr. Burton. Uh, really most appreciated your insights. I think we will be having follow up uh, panels with all three of you uh, in the future. Uh, it's a wealth of experience, and I think these, uh, uh, these arguments can be further articulated in many different ways. Uh, and Dr. Joseph McQuaid, our editor in chief, thank you again for your uh, depth moderation. If anybody watching would like to uh, make sure that they subscribe to our YouTube channel, it's something that uh, we're always trying to keep active on. Uh, we've got new Zooms every week, pretty much, and uh, we'd love for you to be part of this conversation more and more. We want to ensure that Canadians uh, and all citizens of the world feel that they are attached to the various conversations which are having real impact on their lives. And uh, I Obviously, I'm someone who's always proselytizing on behalf of NATO, uh, but it is one of those institutions that is a multilateral miracle. The ability to preserve what we have and to maintain security is not something that you would see every day. Uh, it is a really great organization, and I hope you stay engaged with us, the NATO Association of Canada, to talk more about it. Uh, so again, thank you so much to all, all of our panelists, uh, Emilio, Joseph, uh, a real pleasure. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank